What's up, church family? Come on, let's give Jesus a big shout. We about to get in the Word. We about to have church. Everybody ready to have church today? 70% of the people ready to have church. How about the other 30? Are we ready to have church today? How about over here? Are you guys ready to have church? I'm coming for you because I can hear him over here, but I'm looking for it over here. Okay, praise the Lord. Hey, welcome to Connect Church. My name is Pastor Derek. Everybody calls me PD. Say, what's up, PD? It's just kind of an affectionate conglomeration, you know, of Pastor and Derek and Disaster and Destroyer and all that. Just kind of put into one and just call me PD. So um, I like to have like a little bit of the familiar and the reverential <laughs> together. So it kind of came together. But I'm so glad that you're in church today. I believe we have a very timely word for you. Yeah. I hope you have, as the proverb says, an apt reply that you're like ready to receive. Amen. Are you guys ready to receive? If you're new to Connect, uh, this, this is a talk back culture. And so, and I'm looking for more than Thomas and Josh. And so, but I like them. They help me out a lot. But I'm looking for more. I'm, I'm recruiting. They're the captains, but I'm looking for the rest of the basketball team to show up here this morning. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. I'm just getting warmed up. Just getting warmed up. Praise the Lord. Well, we had a great uh, first service. Of course, it was uh, streamed into three locations. If you don't know, we're one church, many locations. If you are in the Framingham area, that is a great campus for you to check out. And if you're in Bellingham, we have one in the Regal Movie Theater. Praise the Lord, that's meeting there. I think they're about six months old now, doing just awesome, just awesome. Can we give it up for our other campuses, also our online campus as well? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, well, t do me a favor. Uh, I'm going to read from the Word of God and just kind of as a... Uh, uh, kind of a standard. Can we just stand to our feet as I read from the word just real quick? Is that okay? We'll have a little bit of aerobics here, spiritual aerobics here for a few minutes. Praise the Lord. This is a uh, Isaiah 53. This is a messianic prophecy. So this is basically saying uh, in advance what Jesus, uh, who Jesus is, that he's coming and certain characteristics of Jesus. One of the reasons I love um, Jesus, one of the reasons that I am a Christian is not because I've checked my brains at the door, but because of prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. And this particular text is an example of fulfilled prophecy hundreds and hundreds of years before it was prophesied, foretold of the Messiah and that he would come. So this messianic prophecy is powerful for a lot of reasons, but I'm going to highlight a particular reason from this prophecy that I believe is going to be especially relevant to you. Are you ready? The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 53, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, everybody say he, he is Jesus. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. We'll come back to that. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is the key verse, though. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. It was like we couldn't see him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is alive. We thank you that it is, as the Bible says, quick and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It cuts through joints and marrow. We thank you that your word... Lord, is alive to those, and, and it changes those when we receive it. And so I pray, Lord, that we receive your word today, the, a, a rhema word, a word from heaven for us, for us, Lord, as individuals, for us also as a church. In Jesus' name, and all the church said, amen, amen and amen. As you're going down, say, get ready, get ready, get ready, and you may be seated. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, t today's message I want to entitle is, um, is something special. Something special. And uh, I don't care if this is really for one person, 10 people, or 300 people in this room. But I believe for somebody, there's something special for you in this message. Amen? Amen. Uh, tell it to your neighbor. God's got something special for you. Come on, do it. Don't disobey. Come on. God's got something special for you. I'm, I'm going to change my whole message to a message on rebellion if you don't turn and look at somebody once in a while. Praise the Lord. Okay. So this text that we just read, uh, it's, it talks about different characteristics of Jesus. One of them, it says, interestingly enough, um, 
it gives a, a characteristic of Jesus not being very, very handsome, not very comely, not, 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 something, not something to look at. So if you just think about that for a second, I think God maybe has a sense of humor. I think he does. But Jesus is getting ready to come to earth on an impossible mission, mission impossible. He's going to save humanity from themselves, wow. from their sin that separates them uh, from God the Father. And he knows he's going to have to die. So he dies so we can live with him forever. So that when we die, we live with him forever. He dies so that when we die, we live with him forever. That is, an, that is a mission impossible, yes or no. Yeah. But, but on that assignment, you would think, you would think God would at least make him good looking. Right. I mean, just think about Jesus like, you're going to send me down there to die. But on top of that, I'm not going to be good looking. <laughs> Some of you wouldn't have done it just for that, right? You just would have been, I'm out, I'm out. But anyway, I just think that's funny. But I just, there's nothing to do with the message. I just thought that was very interesting. I don't know why it's in there. Maybe because God wanted to keep him humble. You know, didn't want pride to come in there. I don't know. But the Old Testament gives these utterances, these insights into when, where, how uh, Jesus would come to be. But one strong statement in this particular verse that bears acknowledgement, and we're going to spend a good amount of time on it, is it says he will be despised and rejected by men. Uh, he would be one that would be a familiar, acquainted with uh, grief. It's going to be something that he's kind of, it's somewhat normal for him to go through experiences, circumstances, and situations where he would be uh, cast aside, uh, not seen, uh, not observed, not, ex not, not uh, uh, respected. Uh, instead, despised and rejected. And it says he was despised and we did not esteem him. In one translation uh, in the New Testament, John 1.11, uh, it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So the people he even came to, the people he came to save, his own people, the Jews, they did not receive him. And so here's kind of what I want to say at the outset is, one of the signs of Jesus coming, clearly we can see from this text, is he would be rejected and despised. That was a sign to us that it was, in fact, Jesus. Are you with me, everybody? And if that's in there, it's in there for a reason. Amen? If God puts something like that in there, the Son of God, God the Son, God, uh, be uh, God become human... Uh, God uh, incarnate comes to this earth and he's rejected by the people that he comes to. There must be some lesson in this. And I just want to highlight this in the beginning of this message. Th there's going to be something for you to see inside a principle that I'm going to give you in a little bit. But I want you to just walk away today saying, what is the lesson to learn? In these situations, in these circumstances, in these uh, parts of my life, when I, like Jesus, can be despised and rejected. Because sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes we run from it. And sometimes we miss the incredible, special, even spectacular thing that God wants to do in your life because you don't recognize the lesson. Wow. But there are significant implications uh, not just to Jesus in this text, but to you and me. And now I'm going to give you uh, a, an early, like, bomb drop, an early mic drop moment, okay? And as a communicator, uh, you know, we're really encouraged not to do this. I'm breaking a communication rule for some of you who, who like to communicate. When I was in the cemetery, I mean the seminary, <laughs> they would tell you to, like, when you're getting ready to make your big point, you build it, build it, build it, build it over a certain period of time. In fact, sometimes throughout the whole message, you wouldn't even say the big, big thing until maybe even the end. And so, But I'm going to give it to you in the beginning because I know this is a mature second service. Can I have an amen from this house right now, okay? And I, 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 what they would normally say is you build it, build it, build it, you punch him in the face, you drop the mic, and you walk off stage. But I'm not going to do that this morning. Say he's not going to do that this morning. I'm going to highlight this principle now, and then I'm going to unpack it over and over and over again throughout the message because I want this point to come through to you over and over again. Jesus was rejected by men. And when that happens to you, when you're rejected by men, there's a reason. And here's the reason. Here's the principle. If you are being or have been rejected by men, it's a sign. It is an indicator that God has something special for you. 
God has something special for you if you are going through any type or will go through any type of rejection. Because if it happened to Jesus, you can be darn skippy. It's going to happen to you. Are you with me, everybody? The modern vernacular for this might be dissed. Have you ever been dissed by somebody before? Yep. You know what it's like to be dissed? Where you've been kind of cast aside, disrespected, criticized, talked about behind your back, rejected. It reminds me of an early experience when I, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit, like 10, 15 years. I'm going to go back to high school. <laughs> why are you guys laughing? I don't understand why everybody's laughing in here. Uh, but I remember I have, other re I have other experiences where I was rejected, but I can't share them this morning because they still hurt. <laughs> I was thinking about a few of them. But I remember this one where, where something special happened to me out of a rejection. And it just I'm using this for, for color, but I'm also using it to, to kind of make a point, okay? And I, uh, I remember being in high school, my senior prom... Um, I had, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not with my, my beautiful bride of 30 years now. This is before that. This is pre-Stacy, okay? And, and I, I asked this girl to go with me to the prom. Very pretty girl, very popular in our school. She said yes. Come on, somebody. It was a good day. She accepted. I'm not going to tell you how many attempts I made with other people before that. But anyway, it's not part of the story. Don't get into those details. But this girl said yes. And I was so excited, and so I got my tux. Come on, somebody. I got my two tickets to paradise. Uh, that's a song. Never mind. But I got two tickets to the, sh to the, to the, to the event. I'm so excited. And, and it was weeks in advance because I wanted to be ready for this big day, right? Well, anyway, me and this girl, we're kind of hitting it off pretty good. But I just, you know, I, I wasn't feeling her the same way she was kind of feeling me, naturally. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But, but, but this relationship was not the same. And one of the reasons was she wasn't, she wasn't a Christian. And, and I, at this particular time, not earlier, but in my senior year, I was on fire for Jesus. I was, I was, I was, I was a light. I was leading all kinds of people to Jesus. And, and so this girl, I, I was like, I got to get this girl saved. Maybe something will change. Maybe I'll feel differently you know, after I get her saved. And so one of my techniques would be to take her to the church bookstore. We used to have a Christian bookstore downstairs here just outside the, just outside the common and I would strategically put books in the bookstore that led people through different questions that ultimately led them to the most important question where I could lead them to Jesus. That's how clever I was. And so I took it from one book to the next book to the next book to the next book. And sure enough, she asked me that question. You know what? What must I do to be saved? No, she didn't say that. But she said something <laughs> that, that gave me the opportunity to lead her to Christ. And I led her to Christ right in the bookstore of, of this church. And so I thought, oh, now the lights are going to come on. I'm going to feel the same way for her that, I, that she does for me. And, and so what happened? Nothing. I had nothing for her. I didn't feel anything. But praise God, she was going to go to heaven. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but she started picking up on that. She started picking up that vibe. Now, I, I wanted to go to the prom with her. I mean, she was beautiful. You know, and, and, you know, I, I, you know, I want to have a good time. And we were friends. But she started picking up on that. And so two days before the prom, are you feeling where this is going right now? Two days before the senior prom. She calls me up on the phone and she says, Derek, I'm getting the vibe. I'm getting the feeling. You're not into me like I'm into you. And I don't know if you know this, but I've decided to go back to my boyfriend. And so I'm not going to the prom with you. I'm going to go with him. <laughs> Woo! Dissed. How many know ultimate diss? You feeling this right now? Should we go into intercession? I was so upset. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I got 48 hours. For the prom, I mean, i got a reputation to uphold. <laughs> and I remember going to bed that night just rejected and dejected and discouraged. And, and I remember just throwing up like a Hail Mary. Like, God, this is just not right. I lead her to Jesus. I mean, come on, you and her are good health. Throw me a line. Give me something. And all of a sudden, ding. I had this, I had this memory. Uh, this little birdie told me that a friend that I went to middle school with. My mother's in the, in the house to testify to this story, right? Ma, where are you, Ma? Raise your hand. There she is. Uh, this is a true story. Uh, I had a little birdie told me that th this girl that I went to middle school with had missed her prom at the private school in, the, in town, Marion High School, the once late great Marion High School. And she missed it because she was sick, and so she couldn't go. And she was the prom queen junior year. Beautiful, just beautiful girl. And I just... I was like, oh my gosh, that's it, that's it. But I haven't talked to her in so long. What am I going to do? Ding! I'll call her mom. 
This is a true story, everybody. I used to mow their lawn. So I called up. I go, ding, 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 ding. Mrs. Donovan, Mrs. Donovan, hi, how are you? Derek Fry. She goes, oh, Derek, why, oh, how nice. Oh, you are such a good lawn boy. I love how you do those lines back and forth like that so perfectly. What can I do for you? I said, Mrs. Donovan, it's so great to have you on the phone. By the way, I can just tell through the sound of your voice, you look beautiful. <laughs> She's just like, anyway, so she, I, so she says, what can I do for you? I said, listen, I heard, little birdie told me that your sweet daughter missed her prom, and I uh, heard she was sick. Oh, yeah, it was just awful. As you know, Derek, she was the prom queen last year, and she was just devastated. brought this beautiful dress. She's been homesick, but now she's all better, but it's over. It's too I said, that's the reason I'm calling. <laughs> Her chance, I don't know, think about it. You can just get back to me if it works. But I was just wondering, I was looking for somebody to go to the prom with me. Yes, she'll go with you. <laughs> she will go. What? Are you kidding me? She says, I will grease the skids for you. You call tonight at such and such a time. It'll be awesome. I said, Mrs. Donovan, thank you very much. Hang up the phone. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not over yet, so I called that night. I said, Carrie, this is Derek Fry. How are you? I had a long time no see. I know I haven't talked to you since the sixth grade. <sighs> but I've been tracking you. I mean, stalking you. I mean, I, I pay attention to what's going on in your life. And uh, I was just wondering if you would be interested in going to the prom with me. She goes, you know what? My mom talked to me about that. And yeah, it kind of would be cool. I mean, I haven't seen you in a long time, but I hear good things. I said, man, I will pick you up. I got two tickets to paradise. It's going to be an incredible night. Sure enough, we go that night. Of course, I come late, everybody. <laughs> All right? And it was as if it was orchestrated by heaven itself. The doors are closed. I remember opening the doors. On the other side of the doors, th my, my former date with her boyfriend are twirling around in a little circle. And as she came around the circle, bam, the doors open. And I said, Shazam, check out my date, everybody. When you are rejected, when you are turned down, when you are forgotten, I want you to know it's a sign, everybody. It is an indicator that God has something special for you. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But in all those moments when you are rejected, maybe by a girl, a guy, maybe it's by a job, boss, promotion, Maybe you were a singer and they didn't, they didn't put you on American Idol. <laughs> the voice didn't recognize your skills. Maybe you're a speaker and you didn't get that opportunity and other people passed, you know, passed on ahead of you and got ahead of you. And I, I, I know what it's like. I just want you to know, I wish I knew what I knew now. That God didn't want you to fit in, Derek. God didn't want you to fit into that situation because they didn't vote for you, because they didn't pick you, they didn't celebrate you. It's because God didn't want you to fit into that situation because he was up to something. Yeah. He was up to something. There was something happening. There was something going on there. One of the reasons is he didn't let you get that opportunity. He didn't let you get that promotion. He didn't let you go on display at that moment because you would have taken the glory. You would have seen it as the hand of Derek, the hand of fill in the blank. But it needs to be the hand of God. And when it is the hand of God, God will do something greater. God will do something more spectacular than you could ever ask or imagine. Are you with me, everybody? He wants to do something special through some of you. But you have to see the lesson inside of it. Let me give you another story, skipping ahead maybe a half a dozen years. I was in college. And this is a personal story. This one doesn't make me look as good. This, one, this one's more real and raw. But, and some of you haven't heard this story, and I'm not doing justice to it. But by the grace of God, hopefully it trans transfers to you okay. But my then girlfriend, my now wife of 30 years, and I were dating. And, and 30 years of marriage. Come on, somebody. 30 years. Come on. My girlfriend. She, I call her my girlfriend. For 30 years, I've called her my girlfriend. And uh, she's still my girlfriend. We still date. Praise the Lord. But then we were, uh, we were breaking the honor code of a Christian school based on our relationship, our sexual relationship. And ultimately, uh, Stacy got pregnant. And uh, pause for effect. <laughs> and because we were in a Christian school, uh, we got kicked out of the school. We were ejected. 
not just rejected. It was very costly. It was very difficult. And I can remember that situation vividly. But I remember through it, there was many experiences and lessons from it. But one of the biggest lessons for Stacy and I was how are we going to handle that situation? Because in order for something special to happen, you have to see the lesson in the situation. And the lesson for us, because we all make mistakes, can I have any men out there? And he's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And if you think you're standing firm, be careful lest you fall. And there's grace, right? And there's mercy. But in order for that to happen, we have to be, and this is what we had to learn. We had to learn the confession over concealment. There's a tendency when we sin to try to cover our sin, to conceal our sin. And as a result, something special doesn't happen to you in those situations. And so we decided, and it was counterintuitive, and it was against the grain, and it was, it was not supported even by leadership around us. We decided we are going to confess our sin before others. And because we confessed our sin, it looked like it was going to get worse. It looked like things were going to go down the tubes, and we got kicked out of the school for confessing our sin. When other people could have concealed it and kept going to school. But ultimately, God intervened. Okay, and turns the situation around, and in an ultimate sense, we were able to graduate from that school. But let me just skip ahead. That lesson was so significant, and things happened because of it, but not right away. And 20 years later, I was sitting in a boardroom at that same university on an advisory board to the president of the university, and I was leading this meeting on that board, saying to myself, how good is God? It doesn't make sense. Knowing where I came from, knowing what I did, knowing what had happened to me, knowing the mistakes that I had made, and here I am in this situation. God, you hid me all those years. You covered up all these things. But when you were ready, you could pull those things out and do something special. And I spoke before. My daughter's here in the room when I spoke to thousands of students. She was a freshman at Oral Roberts University and got to hear her daddy preach in her freshman year to the entire university of the school I was not only rejected from, but ejected from. God wants to do something special through you, too, if you can embrace the lesson. Glory to God. Amen. That's just a moment for me. Wow. You know, Peter and Jesus were having a conversation. And Jesus said, Peter, this is what happens sometimes when you make mistakes. He says, Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. Wow. But then Jesus said, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And after you come back, you will strengthen others. Some of you... The enemy would like through your circumstances where you've messed up and maybe been rejected, maybe done some things wrong that are the reason you were rejected. Satan wants to sift, but God has a gift. In the middle of that situation, if you will respond right, there is a lesson to be learned where something unbelievable can happen. And Jesus later began to speak over Peter and said, upon this rock, not the church, but the confession that you have understood the revelation of who I am, I will build my church. Peter's revelation became what is now the salvation understanding for the whole world. Peter, what he understood. Are you with me, everybody? God wants to do something special through all of you. And so I look at the different characteristics of this, and I look at the different situations, and I think of David. Everybody say David. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart, Acts, Acts 3, 13, 22. A man after God's own heart? He committed adultery, everybody. He tried to cover it up, everybody. He had the guy murdered. He was a murderer. And yet, he was a man after God's own heart. A lot of it is because how we, he responded to his situations. Are you with me, everybody? And if David could have that kind of a life behind him and God could do some of the things through him, then he could do the same thing through you. Amen. But I want to give you five disses in David's life we can't miss. Five disses we can't miss. Are you with me, everybody? But here's your big idea before we go to that. Stop trying to fit in. Some of the reasons that you're rejected, some of the reasons that you go through some of the situations you're in is because you keep trying to fit in with everybody else. Right. God doesn't want you to fit in. 
He's using some of these things. Maybe not causing them, but he's using them to try to teach you. Stop trying to fit in with everybody else. The Bible calls us in 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a chosen generation. He's called you out of that, not into that, everybody. Stop going into the world, trying to become like the world, to influence the world. You're called out of it to go back into it to influence it. Are you with me, everybody? Stop trying to fit in. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop trying to fit in. Come on, do it. Tell them, stop trying to fit in. So David went through a series of rejections. And I want to highlight these. I, 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 I'm going to be done when I'm done. Can you have an amen out there? First Samuel 16 says, this is the late service. So if you come to this service, you're going to get all of it. You're going to get the rotisserie chicken version of the whole message. I'm not going to leave anything out. All the bones, everything, okay? David in First Samuel chapter 16 was first. He, was, he went through stuff that we can parallel to our life. But I want you to see that th this principle I gave you relates to his life, but it relates to you and me. He was rejected by his father. He was rejected by his father. Samuel, the prophet, if you read this on your own, I don't have time to teach you the whole Bible today. But Samuel was, was told by God, I'm picking another king, and the king's going to come from the house of Jesse. Jesse has eight sons. I want you to go there, and I want you to anoint the king. I'll tell you which one it is. Naturally, he gets there. He starts with the oldest, Eliab, and he has a flask of oil with him. And... He would anoint him with this oil. By the way, this is not oil for a salad, everybody. This is, more, this is more important. It's more symbolic of the anointing of God. He's anointing him, the king. Later he'd be appointed. But first we have to be anointed to do something before we're appointed to do something. Yeah. You getting this, everybody? I'm preaching in here. So he goes to the first son. He goes to anoint him. The oil does not flow. God says it's not him. He goes to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. None of them the oil flows. None of them, God says, that's the one. And finally, Samuel is upset. He's like, come on, is this all you got? I know he comes from this house. Do you have another? And Jesse says, well, there's David, but of course you don't mean him, dis, rejected. Are you tracking everybody? You, how many know it's difficult when you're rejected by your own parents, your own father, your own mother? Some of you know what that's like. You know what it's like to be rejected by your father or by your mother. But here's the thing. God still sees. God still sees you. Even when you're not invited. David wasn't even a candidate for this meeting. He wasn't considered for this meeting. He was overlooked. He, was, he wasn't even a part of the posse of this particular situation. But God saw him. And Samuel calls for him, and he comes, and in so many words, you can read this in your Bible, as soon as David came into the room, and Samuel opened the flask, the oil began to flow. The anointing oil began to flow because God saw something in David that he didn't see in anybody else. Some of you feel like the eighth son. Can I just say something? God sees you. You might feel like you've been overlooked. I know I'm speaking to some people because I just went through this in the last service. I got to hear people's feedback. Some of you feel like that person. Some of you have been overlooked by your parents. Your heavenly father sees you. Your heavenly father sees you. Number two, David was rejected. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 20 and following. He was rejected by his brothers. I'm going to highlight one of his brothers, but his brothers were told by the father to go, uh, excuse me, they were in the army for Israel, and David was told by his father to go and deliver food to his brothers on the front lines, cheese and, cheese and bread, pizza. Go bring some pizza to your brothers. And while he's there, David notices that there is this Philistine that keeps coming out every day, and he's chiding, and he is insulting the Israelite army. And he's this nine-foot, seven-inch behemoth who keeps speaking to them. And basically, it's a mano-a-mano -mano situation. If you can take me, uh, you win. If I can take you, we win. Instead of all of us fighting, and this is happening day after day, David shows up and says, what is up with this Philistine? Why are you guys all hiding in a ditch? And, 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 the, and, this, and the Israelite soldiers go on to say, Dave, hey, listen, not only... Is this Philistine out there, and he's, he's, he's insulting us every day. But Saul is trying to motivate us, and he's told us that anyone who can kill this giant, no taxes for the rest of your life. You don't have to pay. 
You'll be extremely be made extremely wealthy and you get to marry my daughter. David says, come again with them benefits. <laughs> and as soon as he says that, his brother's like, ah, I knew it. I knew why you were here. I knew why you were here. First Samuel 17, 28. It says, why did you come, David? Why did you come here? And who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness with? In your pride and insolence in your heart, for you have come down to see this battle. See, isn't it interesting how certain people know the certain thing that they can say to get right to the heart where it hurts the most? Right? He attacks his role. He attacks uh, his size. He attacks his character. That's what people do that know you best. They know how to hurt you the most. Amen? And then number three, he was rejected by his employer. I'm going somewhere with this. It sounds negative in the beginning, but it'll end up positive at the end. Hang on, hang on, hang on. His employer rejects him. Who's his employer? Saul. He worked for Saul. Did you know that? He had a good government job. That's funny. I don't care what you say. He played the harp. He was a professional musician. He would go in before the king, and he would help him when he's distressed and when he, help him when he's, he needs to be soothed in certain situations. He's paid to do it. But Saul heard what David had said. He can take this Goliath. He can take this champion. And Saul says to him in so many words, you're too young. Uh, you're untrained. Uh, you're too small. Uh, he attacks his, his experience. He attacks his capacity. He attacks uh, his ability. And by the way, I want to speak to the next generation here. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Don't let anybody say to you, you don't have capacity. You don't have the ability. In this house, we will be a next generation church. We are not just building up a church for our grandparents, grandparents. We are building a church for the generation and the generation to come. Can I have an amen in this house? Can I have a better amen in this house? We are here for the future. Have you ever been told by someone important to you that you can't do something? Have you? I'm asking a question. Has anybody been told by somebody important, you can't do that? You can't do that. That's what happened in this situation. That's what David is going through in this situation. He was rejected a second time, and spears were hurled at him. And, 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 this, and in spite of that, David goes out and kills the giant with five stones and a sling, and he chops the giant's head off. And then they're going back into the city, and the Bible says that the women lined the streets and began to sing a song, and if I had a good rap, I'd do it right now. But they were basically saying, Saul has killed his thousands, and David is tens of thousands. And overnight, David goes from a nobody to a somebody. He goes from no followers to a million followers on Instagram. Come on, modernize this, Pastor. <laughs> and Saul gets mad. He gets his feelings hurt. Why are they talking about David? I'm the king here. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, verse 9, the last portion, it says, Saul eyed David from that day forward. I got my eye on that guy. And the Bible says that he sought to kill him. And David leaves that place, and, and he leaves that good government job, and he goes on the run, and he goes on the run into a cave. Everybody say a cave. While he's in the cave hiding, running, because there is a uh, search warrant out to find him, to kill him. In the back of the cave, he finds a bunch of other guys in there, a bunch of rejects. The Bible says that they were discontented in debt and in distress, 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. And while he's back there with all these guys, it, it just because of who he is in his heart, he rallies all of them. And they say, we want you to be our leader. And, and he says yes to that. And he begins to pull these guys together. And they begin to do some incredible things. But because they're no longer on God's team, they have to go over to the other side. And now they're on the Philistine team. What? I, I don't know if you get the significance of that. But that would like be going from a Red Sox fan to a Yankee. It's a big deal. He just killed their champion. And now he's... He's working for him, and he does really, really, really well. He's very successful until one day the Philistines are getting ready to fight the Israelites. The Yankees and the Red Sox are playing. And the captain of the team of the Philistines goes to the guard and basically says, hold on, hold on, hold on. We'll make sure everything's good, everything's good. Who are these Hebrews here? Whoa, 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 whoa. You guys can't play. In fact, you're off the team. Get out of here. So he was rejected by his father, he was rejected by his brother, he was rejected by his boss, and now he's rejected by the other team. 
David's going through a lot of rejection. He's been fired. And he's sent back to the city of Ziklag. And he gets to Ziklag where all his family's supposed to be, his kids are supposed to be. And at least he finds some release and some just acceptance. And no, the city is burnt to the ground. His family and everything in it is gone. And now the rejects turn on him. You know it's bad when you're rejected, but you know it's really bad when you're rejected by the rejects. Turn your neighbor and say, that's a really bad day for David. And they decide, they're voting on, should we, should, we, should we stone him? And the story talks, I preached on this not too long ago, but David found strength in the Lord his God. And, and he spent time with God, and he got perspective from God, and he, he began to see that there's some kind of lesson inside of this situation. And though there was one rejection after another, uh, not liked here, not accepted there, overlooked then, pushed aside, God told him, and God is telling me to tell you, there's a reason for those things in your life. There's a lesson inside every one of those situations for you. You've been rejected and you've been overlooked and you've been cast aside and you haven't been picked and you weren't made, you didn't make first team and you didn't get the promotion because God is something special for you if you can just hang on. Every test as a Christian is to develop your perseverance and your faith and your faithfulness. Because there's, there's an anointing not just before the appointing, there's an anointing before the assignment. And with that assignment, which is heavy that God has for you, that, that heaviness, you've got to be separated from the world. You can't fit in with the rest of the world. You can't be like the rest of the world in order for God to fulfill what he wants to do in and through you. Are you with me, everybody? But let me just say this. This next point is the ultimate rejection. And don't say amen to this because of who's in the room may be with you. But the ultimate rejection could be possibly, in this case, it was David's spouse. If you know what I'm talking about, just wink at me. Don't say amen. I see you. 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 In this particular situation, my final point, David is the king at this time. He's the man. He's finally like large and in charge. And David, this is so important. I need you to stay with me, church. Are you staying with me? Yes. This is so important for our church and for you personally. David is trying to get things in order now. And I believe this has relevance to Connect Church. Prophetic relevance to Connect Church and to you personally. David's trying to get things in order now. He realizes, I just can't be have the anointing, but all of us have to have it. And so the Ark of the Covenant is not in the Holy City. And so he goes to get it to bring it back. The Ark of the Covenant was basically God on site. God on location. I hate to say it like this, but God in a box. Today we're God in a box. Today we carry the presence of God. We are the temple of God. Amen. And so we have to learn how to steward that. We have to learn how to host the presence of God in our lives. But we carry that. But back then, you carried it in the Ark of the Covenant. And there were these special sacraments inside of it that were supportive of that. And so he goes to bring the box back. And as he's bringing the box back into the holy city to put blessing on the city and blessing on the people of God, the box, I don't know, they hit a spot and it starts to fall over. The Ark starts to fall over. And a servant goes to grab it, to prop it up, and he's killed instantly. What? Everybody's freaked out. The guy's dead on demand. They leave the box. They're so freaked out. Some, some theologians say left it for weeks, months. Just, we're out of here. I don't, I don't know what just happened. That was downright scary. But David sought the Lord, and he figured it out. He had, listen, 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 listen. We have to learn how to carry the anointing. One of the reasons something special could happen in your life or will happen in your life is you learn how to carry the anointing for the assignment that God has given you. And David went back to the Ark of the Covenant and he figured out how to put these poles through it. And we're going to begin to carry that anointing. And as they begin to walk, one step, two step, kind of a little nervous. Three, I think this is the right method. Four steps, five steps, six steps, we made it. They stop, hammer time. They begin to praise God. Nobody's dead. They're so excited. Nobody's died. They begin to praise God, hoop and holler. They're like, hey, it worked, it worked. Let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stop. Let's praise God again. Nobody's dead. 
They start getting excited. Now listen, here's a lesson inside it. Not only do we need to learn how to carry the anointing for our assignment, but we also need to learn to celebrate along the way that we are not where we used to be. We may not be where we want to be. We may not be to our ultimate destination, but I'm not back there anymore. People haven't died. People are still alive. Lives are being changed. Things are still happening. And whenever I take six steps, I'm going to stop as a practice. And I'm going to rejoice. And I'm going to worship God. Are you with me, everybody? Come on, give the Lord a big praise for that. Some of you need to just learn how to praise God. You're, you've gone further than you did before. Individually. I look back at my life, I'm like, God. I could short circuit if I started thinking about it too long. I am so not the same person I once was. Amen. There's people that have come to this church that went to my high school. They look at me like, what? <laughs> Only Jesus. Amen. I am not the same person because of Jesus. I am a different person. And I've made progress six steps at a time in my individual life. I don't know who this is for, but this is for people in this room. I know it. I know it. I know it. But here's what happens in the middle of that. In the middle of that moment, his wife was looking in the window. He gets back six paces at a time. Praise the Lord. Six tapes at, paces at a time. Praise the Lord. They get back to the city. And as David gets into the city, he's so excited because now the presence of God is with the people of God. He can't even stand it. The Bible says he worships and praises right out of his freaking clothes. Boom. Don't do that here at Connect, okay? But I like, you, I like to see you worship a little bit more when you come to church than you have. I don't want anybody coming out of their clothes, but I wouldn't mind if you came out of your shoes once in a while. I wouldn't mind if you stood up on your feet once in a while. I wouldn't mind if you shouted unto God once in a while. I wouldn't mind if you let it out just once in a while. You don't have to come out of your clothes, but you ought to come out of your seat once in a while. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I'm fired up this morning. But right then, when that's happening, are you okay, everybody? You're all right? I'm not losing my mind. I'm just, but right in the middle of that, while he's doing that, he's rejoicing, thinking about all that good as God has done. His wife is looking down from the rooftop and despising him in her heart, the person closest to him. And some of you, you've been making progress and things have been going good. And the one person that you expected would be dancing with you. The one person that you thought would be cheering right alongside you, praising God beside you, was dissing you, was despising you, is when, and was rejecting you. And I just want to say, first off, I'm sorry for that. But secondly, it is an indicator. And it is a sign that God has something special for you. If you'll see through it. And David did. Oh my God, I'm going somewhere. David did see it. He didn't get discouraged. He said, woman, listen, you think that I was worshiping crazy right there? You think because I just came out of my clothes, this is the last time? Do you know the hell that I have been through? Do you know how many people have rejected me? My own father and mother didn't remember me. My brothers discounted me. My boss, the king, my king rejected me. And another team rejected me. The rejects rejected me. You're not going to reject me to a point where I shut down. I will get yet more undignified and praise my God. I'm not done yet, is what he said. And so he learned. He learned to praise God along the way when things weren't going his way. One of the ways and one of the reasons, one of the lessons I think for David was through the crisis, he learned how to celebrate with the progress. He celebrated the progress. Have you celebrated your progress? Have you celebrated your progress? When's the last time you celebrated your progress? Would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. My assignment was to tell you that all those things were assigned. An indicator that God wants to do something special in you. Thank you, Jesus. After David's moments of rejection... After his father rejected him, the oil flowed. <laughs> it 
After his brothers rejected him, he killed a giant. Oh, my God. After Saul rejected him, he was embraced by the entire city. After he was rejected by the Philistines and the Amalekites burned his city to the ground, he recovered all, everything. He got it back. There have been others rejected. Joseph was rejected and became the second in command of the most powerful nation in the world. Moses was rejected and was used by God in the most profound way, saved Jesus. Paul was dissed by the church and started more churches than anybody. And, of course, Jesus was despised and rejected by men, yet he has saved through his name more people and healed more people through his name. And because he brought himself low, God brought him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And now the one who is covered and now the one who is hidden is on display at the right hand of God the Father. And when you've been hidden and when you've been covered up, God is about to discover you if you will embrace the lesson that God has for you, are you with me? With every head bowed, every eye closed, let me prophesy over this church. Something special is coming. God is saying this to me and he's saying it to you, church, those who call this home. Connect, you have continued to take steps. You didn't give up. Leaders, I'm so proud of you. When the cart fell over wow. and it seemed like the anointing had left, uh, you figured it out. You asked God for wisdom. You asked God for how do we carry it? How do we do it? And God began to show you. And God began to speak to you again as a church. And he's speaking to some of you individually as well. And the oil, oh, Lord. In this church, the oil is beginning to flow again. It's beginning to flow again. A greater measure of the anointing. Lives are going to be changed. The presence of God is returning in greater measure. Thank you, Connect. I feel like God's saying this through me to us. Thank you, Connect Church. You didn't give up. COVID couldn't kill you. Cancel culture couldn't kill you. The gates of hell couldn't stop you. You're still here. Six steps and you praise. Six steps more. Come on, worship team. And you praise. Six steps more. And you said, we're not dead. We're still alive. We're not closing down. We're opening up new churches, new locations, new small groups, new teams. We're not firing. We're hiring. Oh, I thank you, God, that the oil of God is flowing in Connect Church. We give you praise. We give you, come on, church, will you praise with your voice? Will you just begin to worship God with your voice as we worship to the song? Will you just begin to exalt God? Will you thank Him? Would you just begin to recognize that He's about to do something special in this place? Come on, lift up your voice. Just worship God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for the many things you have done. Thank you for the many things that you have yet to do. Lift your hands before God. Begin to worship Him. It's, it, it's, he's going to do incredible things. Do you believe it? Do you believe it, church? Thank you, God. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus.